Hi, and welcome to the Lone Star Play podcast, where we sit, eat, chat, and repeat. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong, and we are coming to you from Austin, Texas. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for local restaurants, stores, butchers, farmers markets, and more who are using organic, fresh, artisanal, and local sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. The main thing is to actually kind of follow the protests on social media and see what they're, where you're needed and when. Um, I recognize with the pandemic, going on that going to protest is not for everybody it's it's not safe for a lot of people and I would never judge somebody who didn't go out but if you feel healthy if you feel you're low risk if you feel like you're not in contact with a lot of people that you could transfer the virus to um, go to protest because right now bodies in the street is clearly where they're at Um, in some cities they're doing educational stuff Um, I would follow up on that Um, the best way to be a noob (laughs) is to do a lot of listening and not a lot of talking. Hi, and welcome to another episode. My guest today is Amanda Marcotte. She is a writer for Salon.com and also an author. She wrote a book called Troll Nation. And Amanda is from El Paso. Uh, She currently lives in Philly. Um, And so we got her on Zoom and we spoke to her, Um, you know, just talked to her about uh, she wrote a great article about the Black Lives Matter movement and new people joining that movement and what that means, uh, noobs, if you will. So um, we discussed that a little bit. Uh, We discussed politics, sort of, you know, um, El Paso a little bit. Um, it's a great episode. Um, we, we do definitely get into some politics, which we don't, don't normally do on the podcast too, too much. Um, but yeah, we, we did this time. So, um, you know, wherever you stand, left, right, center, up, down, whatever, you know, it's worth, uh, open dialogue. So, um, you know, we talked a little bit about race and of course the Black Lives Matter movement, which is going across America. Um, and we should be paying attention to it and joining it. So, um, yes, we talk a little bit about food as well. Um, she is a, uh, pescatarian sometimes, mainly vegetarian, uh, but she also owns a fur coat. So there's a funny story about that. Make sure to, um, uh, catch that, uh, near the end of, of the episode. So anyway, all right, all right, enough of me babbling. Let's get to the episode again. My guest today, Amanda Markov. Well, great. Thank you so much um, for taking the time uh, to talk to us today. You're in Philadelphia. What, are you in Philadelphia? Philadelphia? Yeah. Lived in New York for like nine years and then we moved to Philly last year. How do you like it? It's great. I love it. I lived in uh, Lancaster for, I don't know, like four years in my early 20s. Uh, I used to go to Philly all the time, but this was a long time ago. I haven't been back to Philly in like 15 years. So. That's, I guess. Yeah. Has it changed? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Probably. I would imagine. Uh, but I bet there's some still some parts that are just the exact same. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. You know? <laughs> you know, that's what I love about cities like that, though. You know, New York. I uh, lived in Europe uh, for a while as well, and same. Th- you know, it's just like they don't change. The towns just don't. Maybe maybe a new ATM, something weird <laughs> like that. Like something well, that sticks out of in- the. Last time I was in Austin, it changed a whole hell of a lot, it seemed. Yes, Austin is uh, changing for sure. Um, absolutely. People aren't too happy about that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that don't mind people moving to a city. That's sort of like an Austin thing. Like, don't, don't move here. That's the big like motto here. Uh, but my thing is, well, you moved here. Why can't somebody else move here? I don't know. Like, that's my, I moved here, so I don't know. It's, I guess it's one of those weird things. They don't want to lose the, the charm, I guess we would say, to what is Austin. I don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, what's funny is it's true. Like when I first moved there in 1995, um, it was already people were still talking about, oh, it's not the same as it used to be. It used to be so much Oh, oh really? Even yeah. back then? That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, I miss the slacker days. I miss Mad Dog and Beans. Like, 
That's so that you know what they'll always say it right like i'll probably be saying it like 10 years from now probably funny. that's funny um well goodness you know what i actually just like 10 minutes ago finished reading an article that you wrote on um salon.com i think yeah it came out today i believe um this morning about the black Lives matter protest um that yeah you went to in philadelphia there um mm -hmm. Look, I mean, it's, you know, I, I do want to get into food and some other things, but this is just such an important issue that's, you know, racing across America, no pun intended there, literally just spreading. I think it's the biggest civil rights movement right in history, I think now, because all these other countries are involved as well. You know, the whole world is getting behind this. And um, I, what I liked about your article, the reason I bring it up is the the noobs part, right? Like new people joining this this movement and you know you seeing that they're making a change and they're becoming a part of it and sort of welcoming welcome welcoming them in excuse me can get that out um so i'm just i don't know if you could maybe just kind of not recap the article i you know you wrote it already but kind of just give our listeners sort of the base behind that of why you even decided to write it that way well, so, I mean, all credit to my partner, who was the one who made the noobs are forever joke, but yeah, I, mean, I saw I, that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But it, I mean, I think you, he came from tech and, and now is in social justice work. And I think like what the sort of connection between the two is, is that like, you know, you're succeeding if you're attracting new people. And I think sometimes, you know, a lot of us progressives who've been in this for a while see some of the noobs and we see some of the mistakes they're making. I mean, there were some white people out there just doing real cringeworthy stuff, real cringeworthy stuff. Oh man. And, and it's, and I'm not saying don't call those people out or make fun of them. I mean, you know, go with God. That's great. But <laughs> I think that it, it's a testament to the power of the Black Lives Matter movement that they're attracting people who want to join. And even if they are awkward or tone deaf or, or otherwise acting like the worst noobs, <laughs> at least they, I feel like activists should congratulate themselves that they're getting noobs at all because you do, movements only persist by growing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, look, you have there's just some people that just aren't going to under they sort of understand the idea or their hearts in the right place, I guess, is the best way to put it. Is that it, basically? Yeah. And I mean, everybody has something to learn. Um, I, I'm just really I'm just really in awe of the Black Lives Matter movement, which has been going on for years and years now. And they've really been able to harness uh, this moment when there was a lot of people that were tuned out during the Obama administration because they thought everything was fine under Obama. It wasn't, obviously. That's why the Black Lives Matter movement was growing back then as well. But like, they could have withered and died, but instead they they changed strategies. They met the moment. They're bringing new people in. And, and then, like you said, it's a, a worldwide movement now. Yeah, it really is amazing. I mean, look, um, I, I just recently spoke to Dustin Lance Black, who was um, he's a board member of the American Foundation for Equal Rights. So they got, you know, Prop 8 passed in California and then led to uh, legalizing gay marriage in the U.S. Right. So talking to him about this movement, um, he lives in London, actually, right now. Um, but his thing was like, don't accept the crumbs because that's what they were trying to give when when they were fighting in California, right? And then they took it to Supreme Court and it became a national thing. But that was his big message of don't don't just take the crumbs. So I guess my, my question to you is like, yeah, that, right? Like, what do we accept from this movement right now, right? Does that make sense? Like, are they just going to throw a few bones here and there and then and we're all just supposed to go away? You know, like, what's our point? Like, what's the, what are we trying to get past? What What do we want to see happen? Well... You know, and I said that Black Lives Matter changed our strategies because of Trump, I think. And one of the things that they changed pretty dramatically was there's an understanding that as long as Donald Trump's in office, they have no ally in the White House, right? Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> under Barack Obama, there was a sense that you could ask the government for relief and they would listen to you. They would come to the table with you. And that that, that was true, obviously. Like... The Department of Justice under Barack Obama like started instituting all these police reforms. 
what we have learned since then was as well meaning as those police reforms were they weren't working and so in a sense Trump being in office was a very clarifying thing that helps, I think, a lot of activists sort of see the reality that the data was also showing, which is those crumbs don't work. Exactly. Um, and now we've got people talking about defunding the police, dismantling police departments. I know yeah. that's a scary idea to people who've never thought about it, but those kind of slogans, I think, are also opening the door for people to actually think long and hard about the questions of what we actually want law enforcement to look like. Yeah, that's a great point. Like when, when you say they're talking about defunding the police, I read, I read an article that Minneapolis, right? They're, they're the city council, I think is going to take some sort of unanimous vote that the mayor can't, um, you know, fight against uh, to disband the police. Like, can you just tell our listeners, like, what does that mean exactly? Well, it's a complicated thing and I'm not entirely sure they know exactly what it's going to look like, but I want to reassure people um, that this isn't as scary as it sounds like they've done this in other places, including Camden, New Jersey, which is just across the river from where I live, um, where they disbanded the police department as it existed and replaced it with something that was more responsive to the community. And it, it not only reduced police brutality, but also reduced crime. So sure. there's nothing to be afraid of, I think, on this. It's a scary new world, but I mean, are the cops, I think the question we have to ask is we have to look at law enforcement now. We look at, have to look at the fact that half of murders are going unsolved, more than half of rapes are going unsolved. A lot of people Ugh. call 911 and no one comes to help them. And we have to say, you know, maybe it sounds scary to defund the police, but then you have to ask, how's the, how, how are the police working out for you right now? Not, not great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um I, look, I'm all open to any ideas, right? Um I think the idea of the police um and look, there's police in my family, you know, friends, uh but still, I you know, look, the idea is to I don't even I think the idea of the police has totally gotten lost in the sense that it's just about crime and going after crime, which that is a part, but it's also about just being a part of the community and uh, I don't know. I just think that, yeah, the idea of it's gotten lost, but it is hard for me to imagine what would be in its place. You know, when we call 911, who's going to show up, right? Like, is there a, there's no police officer. Is there like private safety? I guess I just never heard of this, to be honest with you. I mean, these are solved problems. I'm not an expert sure. in it, but of like course, of course. the people that are I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Uh. <laughs> well, the people that are doing this, I, I mean, have answers to these questions. And it's things like not getting rid of law enforcement, but replacing the police with law enforcement that's more community oriented. I will say this, and I was talking to my partner the other night. My father was a firefighter. And I feel like when I was a kid, there was this sense that the police were useless a lot of the time when the work he did. So you call 911 and, and most of the time when you call 911, you don't need a police officer. You need like the EMT, you need the fire yeah, department. That's true. And, and the fire department would show up and they would help the accident victim. Like they would try to stabilize them or help whatever problem they had. Well, the cops just stood around like with their, uh, can I curse on here? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Yes. Cops just stand around with their thumbs up their asses, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, like, dialing down the clock. And, 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 you know, it was ridiculous. Like, why are the cops just standing there when somebody's, like, got a broken leg? And not helping out. Yeah, for sure. Um, look, again, I'm all for, you know, uh, reevaluate. Obviously, the system we have is not working. Um, not Not just the police uh, alone, but just the way we incarcerate, you know, criminals to begin with, right? And the disparage, uh, the disparity there um, as well, I think is a big problem of having, you know, private um, jails and stuff, especially in the South. It's a major uh, thing here. And honestly, when I started linking to it, I didn't realize how big it was, uh, but then they just become a number, right? So you're just trying to get more people in jail. It's just this horrible system that's, yeah, it's just not working, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. It was a great article, um, by the way. I re really enjoyed the article. And um, I got a question for you. So you, you write for Salon.com. Do, do, you know, obviously the president has been spouting forever this nonsense of fake news, right? Like what, as a journalist, like, what do you think about this whole fake news nonsense thing? I mean, obviously, 
I'm sure you're against it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, uh, it's a, I I know, it's a crazy answer, right? Like, he, I mean, I what I'll say is there's nothing new about this. Like, um, I, and I, back when I was covering the campaign in 2016, um, there were some like people on the alt right who decided to like revive um, an old Nazi slur against the media, which calls it the Lugenpresso, which is literally the lying press. Oh, Jesus. And it didn't really take off because, you know, they were literally like, like celebrating that they're Nazis <laughs> by using a, a German phrase. But um, fake news is literally the same thing. It is saying Lugenpresse. It's saying yeah. the Lion Press. And, and obviously the whole point is, uh, this is a lot of what my book is about, which is like, I, these kinds of tactics are trolling fascists and, and authoritarians and totalitarians really engage in trolling politics, which is to say they say things like fake news or, or Trump has told 18,000 lies <laughs> over the course of his presidency. And most of these lies are like, he's, he's not trying to actually fool you. He's, he's flooding the zone with shit so that people are confused, exhausted, and, and don't know how they're chasing their tail and they don't know how to respond to this. And so in a sense, when he yells fake news, he's not trying to convince anybody. He's trolling people. That's a great, yeah, it, it's just, there's, there's an, right. Like it's just so much, he puts out so much misinformation. You can't even keep up with it. You're trying to work on one thing and he just spouts off with something else. I saw something this weekend about that. He had set his record for the number of tweets that he sent out in a day. Um, I was like 700 tweets in a day. Uh, man, my Siri keeps like <laughs> jumping in here. Um, yeah, he sent out 700 tweets in a day. I mean, that's just crazy. Uh, just crazy. You can't even keep up with the amount of nonsense that, that he puts out. Um, yeah, I was just curious as a journalist. I mean, that's your pride. Like, look, I'm a chef. Right? I'm from the restaurant industry. If somehow it came out like, I don't know, fake chefs or some fake, fake chef movement or something, I would be so against that. I mean, it would just be like, this is crazy. Um, but you're right. You bring back the history, the historical historical aspect to it um, from World War II. And I'm sure it was even before that, there was essences of that. Just misinformation. I guess that's all it is. Just misinformation. Yeah. And, and basically, it's using lies as a loyalty test. I think yeah. the, the most important thing like to think about is what was like the first thing Trump did in office was he made Sean Spicer go out there and lie about the number of people at his inauguration. Like Spicer knew it was a lie. Trump knew it was a lie. Everybody knew it was a lie. The point of making Spicer like humiliate himself by saying an obviously untrue thing that everyone knew was untrue was to sort of make Spicer prove his loyalty. Yeah. That's Trump's big thing, right? Is proving loyalty to him. Uh, which he doesn't show any loyalty in a lot of ways, which is uh, it's just such a crazy, uh, you know, it's such a crazy thing. So yeah, your book came out in 2018. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, look, a, a, as far as now, would you write the same book today? Um, I'd probably sharpen it a little, but I think, uh, I think what has changed is like when I wrote the book, I don't think that it was as obvious to a lot of people how central trolling and, and kind of these, these, well, mostly trolling that tactic is central to kind of the authoritarian way of doing politics. And I think that's become a lot more obvious to a lot of people. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's still the most relevant thing as far as I'm concerned to understand this present moment, which is this isn't, um, these are people that have rejected the kind of traditional way of talking about politics in a liberal democracy, right? Which is this notion that there's a, like an idea meritocracy, there's a public debate and everybody like brings their opinion to the forefront and we all discuss it. And then the best ideas win, right? They're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the reason they don't they say, they say no to that is I think they know they would lose like a fair debate. Sure. 
so instead it's 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 the tool of the fascist which is you know the the boots stomping on a human face forever like it, it, if you can't win by argumentation you just win by force and that's kind of what we're we're seeing now and i, I mean obviously the what's happening at the protests is, has gone from just them using trolling tactics like lying and misinformation campaigns to just straight up beating people with batons. Yeah, the rubber bullets, tear gas. How about that photo op that he had in front of that uh, church uh, up in D.C. and had to clear those protesters out? And I just, I don't know, I just imagine him enjoying that moment of seeing people suffer like that and he's our president, he's supposed to be the leader of the free world. It's a scary, you know, it's funny. I lived overseas like during Obama's whole presidency. And then I come back for like Trump, you know, it's just like, gosh, uh, you know, I picked the worst time to come back to America and live here. Um, for real, I just felt that way for a long time. My wife's uh, Spanish. She's from Spain. And, um, yeah, she's wanted to leave several times <laughs> to be honest with you. It's like, let's get out of here. Uh, but the jobs market in Spain is horrible, so we can't go there. But, um, yeah, you know, how do, how do you see Trump's odds, uh, here for 2020? I mean, it's right around the corner. It's coming so soon. Oh man. I don't want anyone to grow complacent. I think that that's why Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 election in the squeaker because a lot of people just thought she was going to win and they didn't vote and they didn't organize and they didn't knock on doors. They thought she had this in the bag and that she didn't need them. And that turned out not to be true. And I really don't want people in that mindset. <laughs> that said, right. every time I start to like, you know, walk around the house, like, like in this droopy, like sad, depressive state, worried that he's going to win again. Like, I, I reach out to friends who point out that like, um, you know, we have like 13% unemployment, probably a lot higher than that. We have all these people dying. Um, presidents don't win re-election under these circumstances. Yeah, the economy literally is crash. You know, just the whole world stopped. It, it's almost like a sign from Mother Nature to him, like, you know, like we're going to we're going to give uh, give you guys the best chance. Right. Like at the economy. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, I'm with you. Um, we can't we can't. I was one of those people, by the way, back in 2016. You know, I went I mean, I voted and everything, but I went to a party. I remember going to this party like, hey, Hillary Clinton's win. I mean, I just didn't it didn't even enter my mind the possibility, to be honest with you. And it hit me, you know, like a lot of America gut punch. Um, I just didn't think it was happening. I just couldn't believe it was happening. Um, and I don't know the way I see it is uh, Trump definitely, his supporters are like the staunchest supporters that I've ever seen almost politically in my life. Um, you know, people that love Trump love Trump <laughs> and it's crazy how much they love him. Um, it, more than Reagan, you know, it's crazy. Uh, but my, th my thing is, is I don't know if any new people have started to like Trump and maybe I'm wrong. You know, since he took office, were there people on the fence? And since he took office, they're like, yep, he's really doing it. I didn't know about him, but he, man, he's doing a bang up job now. So that's my thing. I almost feel like he's been lo just, just steadily losing people little by little. Not very many, but just steadily. I don't know. Again, I don't want to get too caught up in, you know, it's over for him. But I don't know. That's kind of how I feel. I don't know. What do you think? I think that's pretty close. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. I, he, his approval ratings outside of like that little bubble of hopeful, maybe he's not that bad right at the beginning of his presidency that went away pretty much immediately. His <laughs> approval ratings have never gone above what his voter share was. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the thing. Exactly. Um, I think that also Trump supporters have, you know, give it to them. They, they create loud voices. You know, they one person can sound like 10 and, uh, you know, part of it, too, is that they can be very aggressive and kind of forceful with with their things. And, um, you know, it, I don't know. It's just difficult. Uh, the, the political conversations in the last three and a half years have been the most difficult in my whole life have been these three and a half years, um, you know, losing friendships family and not even from my side just people don't want to talk to me anymore just because i'm liberal it's like i haven't changed i'm still the same patrick you've known your whole life i i'm 
you know what I mean? It's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. It's just, have you lost any relationships like that professionally, personally? Has that happened to you as well? I mean, I will definitely say that it's been very tough for me because a lot of my family voted for Trump and like, I, um, oh, I don't well, yeah. really know where to sit with that. And I, um, I, I struggle constantly with it. Um, my cousin, you know, he, he had the same problem and, and he didn't like, he basically told his parents he needed a break from them for a while, <laughs> you know, <laughs> crazy, crazy. And I, you know, it's, it's a tough thing because it's always right there. Like it, it's, it does feel different. And I think in part of it is because Trump has sort of given his voters permission to stop caring about things like democracy or human rights or, you know, winning an argument by like facts and reason. But like, it, it's, I, you know, I don't want to overuse the word fascism, but it's a very fascist mentality, which is, when you see people go into that space and they, they refuse to acknowledge what they've, they've become, it's, it's very tough. It's very tough. It is. They're, they're just tough conversations. And I, I honestly have them. I don't like having them, you know, to be honest with you. Um, it, it was always, you know, that, that saying, right. I don't know. You grew up in Texas, right? So you probably heard the same thing oh. I did, which was don't discuss politics or religion at the, the dinner table. Right. <laughs> like yeah. that's out the window. Th those days are out the window. I feel <laughs> like that's that's over with yeah <laughs> I right, like, so <laughs> yeah. I mean, which is I, okay I, I guess yeah it is I, I mean it's it's tough because I, I see a lot of people telling folks that have family members that voted for Trump to like talk to them about it and I'm like oh honey I have tried <laughs> 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 totally yes yes yeah my my media family did not vote for trump but i have extended family that i know absolutely did um without a doubt now half my family's from mexico so they don't vote for trump period they live in mexico my mom's from mexico city so oh, cool but they they absolutely do not like trump um <laughs> yeah you, you I go, bet. if you if you go to mexico city <laughs> Holy cow, boy, you talk about despising someone. You thought we hated him here. The holy, I mean, it's another thing down there. Um, I so, mean, he started it. Like He started it, totally. And that's what they say. Boy, they have the worst things to say about him, to be honest with you, if you go down I mean, there. Like, that's fair, though. Totally fair. Absolutely. Again, they start, yeah, it, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just dealing with more my father's side um, of the family and they're just conservative. They're from St. Louis. Um, it's just how it is. I mean, it's just how they are. And I don't know, I don't, I don't deal with them, but I have lost some relationships there because of it. Um, which is crazy. Again, I didn't change just somehow things came to the forefront that were bubbling maybe for years that I think people just got more, they got, you know, tougher to like all of a sudden they could just say things they were not saying before maybe they felt it they've obviously felt it for a long time but now all of a sudden they're just coming out and saying these things to you you know and coming at you from all different angles for me it was more of a racial side you know for my mom being mexican all of a sudden they had a problem with me after 40 years of being in the really? family yeah it's like crazy like that we should go back to mexico and i mean this is like family i've known my whole life I'm not even afraid to talk to about it uh, on here at all because it's the, just my reality and I had to deal with what it. A, um, what a terrible crazy. thing to say. Oh, it's horrible. And uh, I've had family members say things here or there. Uh, when, when my father started dating my mother back in the 70s, early 70s, it did not go over well at the beginning. Um, you know, my mom didn't even speak English. And my father didn't speak Spanish, but they were in love and they were going to get married. And yeah, my dad's family just did not accept it. Um, and I grew up with that my whole life, sort of. They sort of. But as I got older, people became more accepting. You know, my cousins, aunts, uncles, everything, even my grandparents, became. they started going to Mexico, um, which was crazy to see them in Mexico City. Um, yeah, they only went twice, but they, they did go. Uh, they gave it a try. So they became open, but other family, they just didn't. I don't know. It's just, look, I've That's, dealt with that my whole life, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm once so people sorry. find out, ah, it's, it's, um, it sucks. Absolutely. I'm, that's why I'm so for this movement. I realize it's a Black Lives Matter movement, but in a way, I've been not in the same way just because of the way I look. 
unless someone finds out I'm Mexican, they don't really take make that guess about me. So, you know, I don't I've obviously not dealt with it on the same level as, uh, you know, someone who's black, like not even close. Uh, but I definitely had my fair share of it. And it's horrible. It's a horrific feeling. And you don't know what it's like till you feel it till you feel somebody not want to talk to you, sell you something, be around you just because of your heritage. It's crazy. It's a crazy feeling. And I'll never get over it. You know, that feeling. And I felt it like as a teenager, you know, going to school. And and what's funny is when I was a kid in like elementary school, nobody ever said anything like that to me. And everybody got along at my school. It wasn't until we got to middle school that all of a sudden it mattered. And it, it just everyone started defining the lines of where you should be. And um, I don't know. It was just a, a, a weird battle that I had to go through. Um, and especially being in Texas and you would think, oh, well, there's a lot of Mexicans in Texas. Yeah, there are. But there's a lot of racism in Texas. I mean, yeah. I hate to say it. It's, it just is. Uh, you know, you're from here. You, you went to school here. Did you experience stuff like that where you went to school? Oh, I, I mean, absolutely. I, I, uh, I grew up in West Texas. I grew up in El Paso. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's like a majority Hispanic community, yeah. majority Mexican American. And, and despite that, um, and, and in fact, probably in reaction to that, I would say that the white people in El Paso could sometimes be the absolute worst. <laughs> Just so completely <laughs> racist and, and, and mean. And it was, it, it's a, it was a strange thing to grow up with because as far as I could tell, there was nothing but like awesomeness from El Paso being a border town. And I still feel like that to this day. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful place to grow up in a bilingual community. Um, but it, like for whatever reason, white people, a lot of white people I know, like we could not see that they, they, all they would see is, is, is difference and, and they hated it. And it, it, it yeah. was, it was strange. Yeah, it's always it's it's for me it's the culture behind that they are afraid of and that they hate and it's more fear that's what I've learned from racism from people they're just afraid of stuff they haven't seen or experienced or whatever and you know I don't know I think that's that's a lot of it they're just scared of you know for whatever reason I, and I'll be honest with you there's a lot of racists that aren't going to change and I don't think it's worth spending the time on them I'm just going to say that that's just frankly you know they always well you just talk to them and have it no i'm sorry but i'm from the south there are people who are just not going to change who they are and yeah. you know it's just how it is you know it's it's time to pick pick the battles with the people that you can make a difference with right now and get them on our side you know and there's a lot more of them than people who aren't going to change to be honest with you. you know there's more people who are willing to sit down and listen with you and uh, you know, whatever. It's really just about having day-to-day -day conversations, breaking bread with somebody, having a meal with them, you know, taking them to a Mexican restaurant or Korean or a Japanese and letting them see a different culture and just see that we're all the same, that we're all discussing the same stuff. We have problems in our relationships. Bills are hard to pay, you know, family problems. We all deal with the same things, you know. You start to see it's not really that different. You know, there's, there's really not much difference in, in that sense. Um, but the differences that we do have between us, I think that's what makes us beautiful, right? That we're not all the same, that, that there is different colors uh, on the spectrum and different cultures and food and, and dance and art, um, you know, literature, um, you know, poetry, everything that comes with all these different cultures. That's what fascinates me, uh, you know, more than anything. Um, you know, I'm curious, um, Amanda, sorry, I didn't mean to go off on that tangent, but uh, I'm curious, um, you know, growing up in El Paso, you know, first of all, were you a Beto fan? Did you like Beto? Oh, yeah, Beto's What'd great. You, I mean, he's, he's from great. the west side, and I'm from the east side, so, you know. But... <laughs> it's already starting. It's already, I love it. I love it. That is great. Yeah. So when's the, when's the last time you've been back to El Paso? Has it been a while? Um, I went back on first sad occasion when my grandfather uh, died. He wanted to be buried in oh. Corpus, so I'm so um, sorry to hear about that. Yeah, it, it was an interesting, interesting time. I mean, my, my grandfather is from Mexico too. Um, he's just um, white, 
And so I think that confuses a lot of people. <laughs> My mom is, is red hair with freckles and she's full blooded from Mexico city. It just, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of Americans, one of their sort of racist assumptions is that they don't know that Mexico has a lot of racial diversity, too. Just go to Mexico City. You'll see it right <laughs> away. You just see uh, you just see everything. Yeah, and it, is, and it was it was a weird it's a weird time because I think it kind of brought forward to me a lot of these tensions in the way that like my family hasn't dealt with that they just aren't willing to think about which is you know a lot of racism against mexican americans without acknowledging that my grandfather was born in mexico <laughs> and i i couldn't you know at a funeral you can't have these kinds of conversations but it certainly i i still don't even know how to resolve that in my my mind but i um it was it was a it was a difficult thing to have to to think about a lot while in El Paso under the Trump administration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's one of those weird things about you know being liberal in a red state like Texas. I just I love this state so much, and there's just so many great people. Now I have lived in a lot of different places. I've lived in Mexico. You know, like I said, I lived um, up north and. Um, you know, Lancaster and I've lived in Florida. Um, but Texas is, I just love Texas. This is where I grew up. I went to school. Um, I wasn't born here, but this is just, I don't know. I love this state, but at the same time, it's such a frustrating place to live in a lot of ways. Um, but there's such a battle in the state right now. How do you see what's happening? I mean, do you, under, do you understand what I'm saying? Like just the blue city, red state, I mean, obviously you know about that, but like, how do you see Texas progressing? You know, what, what do you think about the state? I mean, that's a tough question. I mean, everyone has been saying my entire life that Texas is on the verge of like turning blue and yet it's just always <laughs> out of reach. Right. Totally. And, and it's like become a much more racially diverse state in my lifetime. It's a minority majority state. Now it's uh, in Austin where you live now there's, a huge uh, influx of new people that are largely liberals, white liberals, but still largely liberal. And, you know, I, you definitely, s I, I would spend a lot of time when I lived there, when I was uh, starting out as a writer, trying to explain to people outside of the state that like, it's a much different state than you think it is. That, like, the reason it's so red is these like suburban and rural areas are very conservative. But if you actually get Houston or Dallas or El Paso or Austin or San Antonio, like it's a democratic bastion just as surely as it is in some of the bluer states that just happen to have bigger cities that have more control. And, you know, now I live in Pennsylvania and then I lived in New York city for a while, like, like almost a decade before that. And then it's, it's perversely kind of the same, which is like, if you're in the city, it's very liberal. And if you're outside of the city, it's very conservative. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yes. <laughs> that surprised me about New York, to be honest with you, when I moved up there and started traveling up through New York state um, and even Pennsylvania, right? You get, it's the same. It may be uh, worse in Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's true. Especially where I lived in Lancaster, um, which specifically, I remember I even lived in these little bitty towns. Like one was called Ephrata and Lidditz, I think, was the name of it. God, that's been so long. Um, little Amish towns. It's just Amish. Uh, boy, that was just another. I should do a whole podcast on that. That was all fascinating uh, <laughs> experience living through that. Do you ever get out to see any of that living in? Well, I got, you've been there a year. I mean, have yeah. you traveled out to that? No, I, you know, I wish I could do more of that. I've barely gone to the countryside out here. Like I like hang out in Philly. I go back to New York and that's functionally my life. <laughs> Which are two phenomenally great cities. So there's nothing wrong with that. Plus we've been on lockdown for, yeah. I don't even know. My how life long has now it been a, now? Yeah. My life now is my row house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How crazy. So what have you been doing for the live? Been writing a ton? Do you maybe have a new book? Like what's, how has the lockdown been for you? Um, it, you know, it's, it's not great, 
but I don't think it is for anybody. I've been very fortunate. I think honestly, like moving out of New York where you have these teeny little apartments and shitty kitchens to a place where, I mean, by Texas standards, my house is probably still pretty small. <laughs> <laughs> New York standards, it's a mansion. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> look at all this uh, space, right? Like, it is it's fun. And, and, you know, this is a food podcast, so I, I definitely feel like I can wax on about, like, the greatness of Pennsylvania in terms of, like, farmer's markets, CSAs, things like that. You can... So I just spend a lot of time thinking about food and cooking. <laughs> That's awesome. What kind of stuff are you cooking it? I know you're, you said you're a pescatarian. So obviously a lot of, a lot of fish. Um, not much actually. Like I, like I'm mostly vegetarian and then do some fish once in a Just blue. here and there. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Right but on. I, I don't want to like front, like I never eat any flesh at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you gotta be careful with that i knew a vegan uh food truck owner um that wore a leather jacket to work one time boy let me tell you <laughs> it didn't go over well for her she's like i had it in my closet for before i was vegan i forgot i didn't <laughs> i'll oh, never man. forget that story i i've had this similar thing happen where i have my grandmother's fur coat and it's almost in perfect condition because she had it made in mexico and you can imagine the amount of times you needed to wear a fur coat in Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's hilarious. So I will wear it. And people are like, aren't you a vegetarian? I'm like, these animals died like in the 30s. <laughs> uh, is a historical connection to this fur coat here. Yeah. <laughs> they were petrified. All right. It's a petrified fur coat. Uh, God, that's, um, yeah, that's funny. So, okay. So vegetarian, like, so what kind of stuff are you, you making at home? I don't know. What's your go-to dish? What are you? Well, what has been really exciting as a Texan is in New York city, like Mexican food, forget about it. <laughs> it's, it's no good great. Mexican food, right? It, 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 you know what it is? I realized when I got to Philly is that it's a tortilla. You can't get any good tortillas in, that's in what it New is. York city. Yep. But in Philadelphia, there are a lot of Mexican immigrants and there is a lot of uh, tortillas. And nice. so I have gotten back into making lots and lots of tacos. Oh, beautiful. Right. Going without tacos is like it's punishment. It should be like part of something a judge gives out for crimes. Uh, no tacos for two years. You're just like, ah. uh, <laughs> yeah, when I lived in Europe, I didn't have a taco for like three years. I, they don't oh have God. tacos. I was, I, I don't know how I served. My mom asked me that, like, how did, mijo, mijo, how did you survive? You know, I'm like, I don't know, mom. I just, I, st I was eating kebabs. I got the closest thing I could find to, you know, to a, to a taco. That's it. I did go to a place to try to give me a burrito one time. I mean, it was like the worst experience dining out, period, I think I ever had. I was just like, this guy's shut it down. This well, doesn't even need to be in. happening. This is not a burrito. I don't know what you call this. It's not. Anyway, yeah, no tortillas. So, okay. So you're eating, you're eating a lot of tacos. Uh, what about salsa? Do you do your own salsa or do you have like a brand you like to buy? Because salsa is oh. crucial for the, for the taco. I mean, the tortilla that I go to makes pico de gallo. And so like I buy that with the like... Um, with all the little hot sauces that they have. I was making my own hot sauce for months. <laughs> uh, I've run out of it. Like basically because my habanero plant in my backyard just last summer went completely bonkers. I was like, I don't know what to do with all these habaneros. And another friend of mine who lives in New York and he's from Texas, he's like, you should make your own hot sauce. And I was like, that's a great idea. So I, I was making hot sauce in the instant pot, but it, it, it was, <laughs> so much hot sauce i don't even i made i think like 24 cups of hot sauce oh my god that is just stacks of it in my freezer of habanero hot sauce honey what's for dinner tonight why are you asking you know what we're eating is salsa <laughs> i just I, it took me like six months to eat it all <laughs> Just everybody, like, you show up to a party, like, with a gift that just everybody knows already. It's salsa. I guarantee you she's giving you salsa. Like. It's true. I'm just like, <laughs> right. here's my homemade habanero hot sauce. And for the non-Texans here, be careful. It is actually hot. 
<laughs> habanero is a hot pepper to use in hot sauce, right? Like that is no joke. That's no playing around hot sauce. Uh, <laughs> it sure. was no playing around hot sauce. No, no, and not it, at I, all. It was kind of vile because I would make it in the instant pot in the kitchen and then I would release it. <laughs> oh my God, the fumes. And, I, and the cats would run out of the kitchen. <laughs> and I would Those be crying. Cats. Of course. Oh my God, that's hilarious. Oh, I got a trick for that, a kitchen trick to help you with that. Hmm. So look, this is going to, it's going to seem ridiculous and it may even, it will look ridiculous but it will work. It also works when you cut onions. You get a, you get a, a hat and you underneath the bill right here, you put a piece of bread. Really? <laughs> yep. I know just the sandwich bread. I'm telling you. And it just under the bill, of the hat, you keep that bread there and it just absorbs, um, all everything coming up. I, I know it sounds crazy, but actually is a kitchen hack. It does work. Now, we don't use it in in real kitchens, though. It's kind of one of those things where you, you wouldn't use it. I had maybe at say, home. I had a friend say, "Why don't you try swimming goggles?" <laughs> <laughs> those work too. That's a great idea, actually. Yeah, I was like, "Huh." I, I think I'm going to next year. This year, I'm going to take my instant pot outside and plug it in there. <laughs> that's a great idea. I should Listen, have thought of that. That's last a great year. idea. That's a great idea. So you have a habanero plant. Well, first of all, that's cool, right? So you got a little, uh, what other plants? So you, you grow other, other stuff? Yeah. Um, so I'm growing, well, again, I'm a Texan. So I'm growing shishito peppers, jalapeno oh. peppers, bell peppers. <laughs> um, and this, and I'm trying, this year I'm doing zucchini. Um, oh, wow chard broccoli cauliflower stuff like that um that's a lot yeah we don't get enough sunshine for tomatoes but um we'll see we'll see i've only this is only my second year with the garden in philly so <laughs> i i would say you're doing great that's a lot that's a lot more than i have in my garden i just have herbs my thing is herbs are just so easy to keep going i just got every kind of herb you can imagine in a couple uh, things, all my veggies and all that. I just buy locally from farms just to support, you know, but yeah. I would like to get, uh, there's a guy here from Austin, um, who actually for about 10 years, he provided all the best vegetables and fruit to all the best restaurants from Dallas, Austin, you know, uh, oh, really? Houston, you know, like Ola May, Uchi, right. Just the best places, the James Beard chefs here. Uh, he decided last year or actually when the pandemic hit, he had to pivot. He had to adapt just like a lot of people from the restaurant industry. But what he started doing is he started this project called Cultivate Tex. And what they do is they come to your house, set up the garden for you, seed it, do everything. And basically, depending on however far you want to get involved, they'll, you know, supplement the rest. So if you don't want to be involved, they'll do everything for you. And you literally just get the fruit of the labor, no pun intended. Or you can be involved with the process and learn with them when they're out there. I just thought that was such a great idea. And nobody is doing that. I, I thought nobody's doing that. He said, no, nobody's offering that. Uh, that's crazy. And they're really trying to use front people, the front yard of, of people here in Texas, you know, for the for the waste of it, right? Just um, it's a sort of an excess waste of front yard. People just don't use the front yards anymore. So yeah, no, I mean, that's fantastic. Like when I lived in Texas, I, I, I owned a house for a bit and I was really, I, I dug up half my lawn and was like building like a garden out of it. But then I sold the house. <laughs> <laughs> like, and you get this half built garden guys. It's awesome. <laughs> D, 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 DIY garden. Ready to go. <laughs> I started it for you guys. <laughs> Well, that. lawns at lawns are garbage, especially in Texas. Gosh, you know, I went. I remember when I went to San Francisco, and it was my first time to go there. And I remember seeing all these. Well, outside of the city of San Francisco, I guess more in Napa Valley-ish, but all the houses had rocks front yard, like rock yards, yeah. just all rock. And I had never. Yeah, I loved it. I had someone. I it had never dawned on me the idea of the waste of the lawn i just ne for some i know it sounds ridiculous but it just never dawned on me and then someone is just like look yeah this is a way you don't need the, the yard it's way the water right just 
I just thought, oh God, that's fantastic. Why don't we do that everywhere? Because look, first of all, who likes cutting a yard? The, right? Exactly. That's like <laughs> that's horrible. I hate cutting the yard. I hate weed eating. I hate, I'm just not a man's man guy. I grew up here in Texas. I heard that my whole life, you know, be a man. Well, that's just not me. I'm just not that guy. Um, I can't do that stuff. I hate doing it. So I wish I could get some rock garden out here. But yeah, that's a, for the environment. I mean, that's in El Paso. That's literally all they do. They've desertified everything. Everyone just has rock yards now. And in fact, um, it's the, the uh, military cemetery at Fort Bliss that we buried my grandfather in. Um, they dug up all the grass and redid it with rocks and sand. Oh, it's wow. beautiful. Wow. Oh, it's sand too. Oh, that's, that's the way to go. Desertify. Is that what you said? Desertify? I yeah, don't know that word. I don't know. If that sounds great. Hey, anymore. that sounds it made it, it immediately clicked of what that means. Uh, so I'm stealing that. I'm going to start using that word because uh, that's that's the movement. That's the next movement uh, that should happen for sure. Uh, well, look, Amanda, look, I you know, I don't know how much uh, time you have, so I, I don't want to take up too much um, of your time. But I wrote I want to make sure that we talk about is just any other any projects that you have coming up, anything that we should be knowing about or, or following. I mean, I'm just still working at Salon. I I write almost every day there, um, um, so check it out. And um, I'm not working on any books right now, thank goodness, because it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, but just yeah, I would I, I would ask listeners just to stop by Salon and and read. We have um, a lot of news coverage, but we also do a lot of like food and culture uh, coverage as well. So. Absolutely. No, it's a great website. Um, again, the article you wrote was, um, uh, it's fantastic. I re really, really enjoyed it. Uh, how, how long did it take you to write that, the book you, that you wrote before? Oh my, three hard months. <laughs> of just constant. Constant writing. Right, yeah. Geez. Yeah. It's not a long book, but it, it's, yeah. it took Still. a it, Yeah. I think most people try to spend a, about a year on a book, but we wanted to turn around really fast. Yeah, right on. Well, look, there is a lot of content out right now. You got a pandemic, right? There's so much happening. It's almost like out of a movie, right? The pandemic, Trump's president, the Black Lives uh, Matter movement is happening right now. Um, it, it's just a crazy time. Look, you know what I would love, Amanda, is if 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 you feel like I don't want, I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, this isn't live anyway. So, if you would like to give our listeners um, and viewers um, uh, a message just about the Black Lives Matter movement and what people can do to help that movement, you know, ways to support that. Um, you know, I would say um, the main thing is to actually kind of follow the protests on social media and see what they're, where you're needed and when. Um, I recognize with the pandemic going on that going to protests is not for everybody. It's, it's not a safe for a lot of people and I would never judge somebody who didn't go out. But if you feel healthy, if you feel you're low risk, if you feel like you're not in contact with a lot of people that you could transfer the virus to, um, go to protests because Right now, bodies in the street is clearly where they're at. Um, in some cities, they're doing educational stuff. Um, I would follow up on that. Um, the best way to be a noob <laughs> is to do a lot of listening and not a lot of talking. Yes, I concur with that. That's, the be that's it right there, right? Listen. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Beautiful. That's perfect. That's a, that well better. So I would have just bumbled through something to tell our listeners. So I'd rather it come from you and sound proper. Um, well, you know. <laughs> so look, um, again, thank you so much um, for taking the time. I hope the weather's uh, good in Philly there. If I remember around this time, it's finally starting to get good. The snow is, is gone. Um, it'll stay, at least for me, it stayed until May sometimes. Uh, maybe not, maybe just one year that that happened, but um yeah so hopefully the weather's it's getting to good weather you've been waiting for that for a long time yeah so, it's finally hot <laughs> yeah finally yeah finally hot not texas hot but it, it gets close um so yeah so i hope um you know hope you get to get out of the house soon and, and continue to do other things and you know thank you for everything that you're doing uh for the movement and all your writing and, and everything you provide um 
you know, to your readers uh, and to our listeners and viewers. So again, thank you so much, um, Amanda, for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. I really hope you enjoyed that podcast as much as I did. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to email the podcast at patrick at texasrealfood.com. And don't forget, you can check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, you know, all the different places you can get podcasts. You'll, you'll find us on there. Or you can just go to our website, go to the Lone Star Plate. Dot com. And you can check us out on YouTube if you want to watch it. You know, we video these, now, you know, on a little webcam here. And go to the Texas Real Food YouTube channel and you can find it there. Make sure to follow uh, Texas Real Food as well on Instagram and Facebook. Subscribe. Um, and if you, you know, are so inclined, please leave us a review anywhere you can. You know, follow us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcast. Uh, that would really help us out. Thanks again for listening. Really do appreciate it. Um, without you guys, we will, you know, what's the point of doing this? So, if you have any suggestions on how we can make the show better, please let us know. Thanks again. Be safe out there. Wash your hands.